Welcome back to the PFC podcast. The views and opinions you are about to hear are the speakers and do not necessarily reflect those of anyone else. Now on to the podcast. Welcome back to the PFC podcast. Today I have uh, Doug with me and we're going to talk about team dynamics. And what I mean by that is not uh, how to function as a team normally, but how to function as a team when you're dealing with a critically injured patient. And the reason why I came up with this topic is uh, just watching different training scenarios, different courses. Um, I see a lot of teams, a lot of medics struggle when working together as far as everybody's working individually on one patient. They're working on like the lower half of the body, they're working on the upper half of the body. They're not really communicating with each other and there's nobody really watching the overall, like the global presentation of this patient and making decisions to move the patient further down the field outside of the individual tasks. So today I'm with Doug to get his experience uh, working from a uh, especially Baltimore Shock Trauma, very high volume uh, facility. Uh, Doug, have you had similar experience witnessing things like this? Yeah, hey Dennis, um, absolutely, absolutely. I've seen you know both the, the good and the bad of team dynamics in my um, many years as a critical care physician and also training um, you know, training medics in special operations. Uh, then on the on the good end, you know, when you have a team that has at least minimally rehearsed the various roles, uh, which we'll get into the details of, I'm sure, the various roles uh, that are required to stabilize uh, a critically injured patient, uh, w- you know, with a leader who's also rehearsed that role then um, things go as well as they possibly can. Uh, and, and when you don't and uh, everybody is you know, trying to do their own thing or everybody's focusing on one thing and nobody's focused on what else is going on, uh, then you have the potential to miss things uh, and, uh, and, for, and for things to go wrong. And sometimes that affects the, um, you know, sometimes that affects the outcome of the patient. And I've seen that both, you know, in training with medics, uh, I've seen it in AARs from real-world scenarios in some of our soft AORs, uh, and I've definitely seen it in the hospital, and I've experienced it firsthand. You know, I've been an uh, an ineffective uh, leader uh, of code situations. You know, code basically where where something life-threatening is happening, and you have to move quickly to stabilize the patient and. And I think I've been an effective leader in hopefully more situations than ineffective. Yeah, the scenario I have in my mind is there was a patient, uh, it was a blast patient, had a uh, visceration, had an amputation, had a uh, some facial trauma, and the team, you know, the team as a whole individually, they're very uh, they're stellar operators. Had I taken everybody away except one patient, I think they could have handled it um, very well. But um, but when I when they got put together, um, they missed things like the amputation, not putting a tourniquet on it. Um, you know, all all four people took turns going through the bowel looking for tiny little bleeds, but the amp was still bleeding. Uh, they missed a downside wound that was sucking air. Um, the crike gone, went in backwards, so the tube opening was actually at the mouth versus down the respiratory uh, tree. Um, and they just kind of stepped all over each other. Um, so that's why I came up with this, this podcast, to uh, hopefully get people to start thinking about how to train and how to organize themselves. Um, but speaking of organizations, so you know, places like uh, Baltimore Shock Trauma, very high volume trauma uh, facilities. How do they tackle this team dynamics? How do they build a team? Sure. Um, 
Well, at, at Shock, where I trained in my critical for part of my critical care fellowship, you know, they had they saw so much trauma on a daily basis that they were basically able to just protocolize, you know, literally the positions around the patient where people stood, and uh, and the role um, of the person standing in that position. And so, you know, you knew that if you were at the head of the bed on the patient's right side, lying face up, that you were going to be um, um, assisting the um, person who placed the IV and hanging fluids. And then if you were the person's, you know, next on the patient's right, so closer toward the foot, you were going to be IV access. Um, the two people at the head of the bed were always anesthesia, um, and uh, I trained um, a couple of months on the an- trauma anesthesia service, you know, f- for airway management. And one of those person people was always placing the airway, providing or, well, providing mass ventilations first, assessing the airway. Um, actually, let me back up and go in really the proper order, assessing the airway. Um, determining whether a definitive airway needed to be done or assisted ventilations, providing assisted ventilations, whether or not an airway was going to be placed if those were needed, and then as a bridge to placing the airway. And then the second person was, you know, giving you all your airway tools and your drugs and pushing those drugs for you on your command. Everybody on the patient's left was the, um, was the surgical team that were doing the fast exam uh, and the primary survey and calling them out to a recorder who was always closer to the foot of the bed or kind of away from the fray but with an earshot to hear everything and then the quarterback the person who was overall you know running the whole trauma code uh, would stand at the foot of the bed basically just observing and that's that's really the role of the team leader is is to observe and that's how you cut down on those um, Incidences where things like an amputation are missed, things like uh, you know a sucking chest wound or uh, on the backside are missed because they are are continually running through this internal loop of uh, our internal checklist of you know we've done this, we haven't done that, and and that's and that's basically all you do. And and as soon as you get involved in doing something. That will knock you. That will knock that checklist loop off of its rails, and you can get stuck kind of on a single thing. And that's where I've seen, you know, resuscitations go off the rails the most, um, both in training and in real world. And, and you know, you do have to address life-threatening things as they happen. Um, but what you can't let happen is to address a life-threatening thing and then forget to keep going with wherever you left off. Mm-hmm. And and you know, whether that's completing a primary survey, which in your case it was, you know, because a primary survey would have caught both the leg wound and the chest wound, um, or doing a secondary survey um, or completing a fast exam. And we have examples, several examples from theater that I've re- reviewed where, you know, a primary neurologic injury was, was diagnosed, you know, severed spine, severe TBI, and a secondary internal bleeding injury and blunt trauma was missed either for hours and in one case for days, mm-hmm. um, be, because you know you and I'm, I wasn't there, so I, I don't want to point fingers, but but you know my suspicion is that if you had had somebody quarterbacking that or at least QCing it, um, you know from that seeing the whole field standpoint, you would have said, oh, you know how far did we get in our primary survey? Oh, we only got to hear. Well, let's you know, let's do a fast exam, mm. um, that type of thing. So that you know, at shock trauma is sort of automatic. You knew by where you were standing, what you were going to be doing, and and you had so many hundreds of reps that it just became automatic. Uh, you know, at at um, the military hospital they worked at, that was lower volume, but we still had people come in the door, um, both with traumatic and uh, in, uh, both with traumatic cases. And also non-traumatic cases, cardiac arrest in the field, uh, or res- you know, respiratory arrest in the field. Um, what would happen is, since you were you didn't know who was going to be on that day and who was going to come when the overhead code was called, you generally had some time to react um, once you got to the emergency room until EMS got there with a the patient. 
and then you know there'd still be that recorder and you would every every position would check in you know anesthesia is here for airway great surgery is here for trauma great you know critical care is here for you know whatever oversight um, um, ultrasound exam central line placement you know uh, other stuff and everybody would sort of you know look at each other across the room and say here are my roles you know I've got somebody on meds pharmacies here for meds nurses here for IV access um, you know that type of stuff so it wouldn't be so much automatic that everybody knew by where they stood what they should be doing but everybody had a chance everybody knew what roles needed to be filled and and everybody filled those roles until the until they were all complete and then once that happened everybody else got out of the room Mm -hmm. Um, so you wouldn't have too much chaos. So this is kind of a softball question, but you're talking about different kind of stations around the patient's body. Correct. And then you have the, the quarterback, the team leader at the foot of the bed. Why, why do you even really need that quarterback at the foot of the bed? Why can't you just have your specialties, your, the, the people that are very good at a particular task, why can't you just have them descend on the patient and do their thing? Again, because uh, of the phenomenon that you get drawn into whatever it is that you're doing um, to the extent that you can miss things. And you know, I don't care how expert you are, that, that's gonna happen. I mean, it's happened to me. Not that you know, I consider myself a great expert, but I've, I've seen it happen you know, so many times. And people who study, you know, people who study the dynamics of mission critical teams, um, you know, we'll tell you. We'll tell you that there has to be some oversight. Somebody, you know, some some check on the group um, to make sure things aren't getting missed, uh, and also to make sure that things that are asked for or things that are said need to be done actually are done and um, uh, and aren't missed. Mm. You know, so it, very frequently during resuscitations. In fact, I can't think of a single one where it hasn't been done. Whoever's leading the resuscitation will ask the person who's documenting, you know, have we missed anything? When was that drug given? Was this, you know, you know, one, you know, um, was a tourniquet applied? Was a fast exam applied? And they'll basically cross-reference their internal checklist of what needs to be done with the recorder um, to to make sure that. The, their internal checklist was actually accomplished mm -hmm. because sometimes even as a team leader you think that something's done and it hasn't been mm -hmm. and and so even the team leader has a backup right um, now i realize that in in combat you know you're not going to have all those assets but there still is a way you know it, there still is a way to do this with fewer assets uh, and less experience right um speaking of that so how do we Take a you know a well a well organized and experienced team like at Baltimore, and apply that to you know the operational environment because sometimes you know I'm the only medic I'm the only person treating sometimes you know I have several people I have lots of help so how do I uh, take a, a concept like that and adapt it for myself? Yeah, I mean if it's you alone, um, that's a bad day. Um, I'm a big believer in, in written checklists. Um, you know, the, um, the T tri C card has a bunch of things that need to be filled out. Mm -hmm. And, um, and you know, if you've got that set off to one side and you're working a patient solo and you look over the card, you know, and you realize, oh, I haven't finished a primary survey. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, or you look at the, the, the schematic of the of the casualty, you know, uh, that should prompt you to say, "Have I done a primary survey or not?" Um, and on the prolonged field care uh, flow sheet, you know, there's a good checklist along the right side. Um, a little bit more, um, you know, later in the resuscitation, but have I done all these things, or you know, do these things apply to my patient? And if they do, have I done them? Mm -hmm. uh, hopefully, if you're getting into prolonged field care as a solo medic, you are getting some help. Um, but, uh, you know, I'll look at the team um, m more, um, and that is, you know, you, you need to 
you basically just need to train as a team. You know, the days where, you know, Doc goes to medical training and the team, you know, does all their stuff uh, don't really work when evac in a prolonged field care environment where evacuation could be delayed by hours to up to, you know, days potentially. Um, and the time to train the team is not when you're taking your first casualty, you know. Mm-hmm. And, um, I remember one of the um, medics in one of the SF groups who took a casualty blunt force trauma due to a motor vehicle accident um, of some U.S. Embassy personnel, you know, within less than 24 hours, him arriving in country with half of his ODA, and one of his AAR comments was like, man, I wish we had trained as a team more, um, because I was just mentally spent and task saturated by, um, you know, within hours Mm -hmm. of managing this patient. And he had him in a local military hospital, but half of his battle was um, quality controlling, you know, the local national providers Mm -hmm. uh, because their standard of care was different from our standards of care. Right. Um, Now, as far as medical training, you know, the medic training his his teammates and and the basics of, you know, March and T-Tri-C and these individual skills, how would you train for them to work as a team on, you know, a one patient, two patients? Um, so good point. I mean, there's definitely two different scenarios. So you have one patient, the whole team can take care of the patient, and then you have, you know, a MASCAL, which is, you know, MASCAL is just defined as any any number of patients that overwhelm your resources, which for, you know, split ODA or a smaller team could could be, you know, could be two. Right. Um, but certainly in MassCal, you're you're going to react differently mm-hmm. um, than you would with one primary casualty, especially you know, especially if it's one of your teammates. Um, however, there's systems that can be applied to both, and you basically need to train on both. You know, you, you need to, if a MassCal is going to be in your in your wheelhouse operationally, um, you need to train. You know how to triage, how to write basic notes, how to do basic exams, um, and um, stabilize life-threatening conditions and keep moving, you know, until all the patients are, patients are stabilized and triaged. And then you, and then you re-engage, you know, your sickest patients in terms of monitoring and follow up and additional steps that need to be done. That's one very specific scenario that needs to be trained. Um, and again, there's a leader for that. Probably the person who's doing the triage should be the medic. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, um, it should be the medic, uh, and leave all all the life threatening, inter- you know, stabilization of life threatening interventions to the other team members. You know, you could have a guy, you know, a bleeder guy. You could have an airway guy, um, mm-hmm. and you cross train your teams to that. And the airway, you know, really, most of the time will be positioning and mass ventilation and a lot of times it's just positioning put in an NPA will get you out of a lot of airway difficulty Mm -hmm. not all of them but more than 50 percent um you know and bleeding everybody on the team should have bleeding as a bleeding control as as a reflex um and and so that and and you know just get some reps on that in your in your training um and if you train as a team then when it happens in real life you know, you'll be better prepared. Every rep increases your ability to do better the next time. And so one rep is better than none, two is better than one, five is better than four. You know, you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have to be a lot. Um, But, you know, you don't, you know, you wouldn't train for clearing buildings individually and then come together in the stack for the first time medicine, you know, treating a critically ill or tr- critically injured casualty or mascal is the same thing. It's the same complexity uh, is the same complexity as, as a building clearing operation. Um, and it requires the same amount of training and oversight. You've always, you know, you've got somebody you, when you're clearing buildings, you've got somebody who's trying to, you know, see the whole field and know where everybody is. Um, and, and how things are going, and direct uh, and, and direct the team or teams through those buildings. Mm-hmm. Same thing with medicine. It's, it's exactly the same thing. Um, for one casualty, you know, you're really going to want to train 
definitely you're going to want to train the team, the entire team on assessment. Like everybody in the team should be able to do a primary survey, right? From head to toe, front side and back side, they should know how to, you know, roll the patient, you know, secure the air, secure the, the C-spine, roll the patient safely, check the back side and stop bleeding um, or perform critical interventions as they come to them, nasal airway, decompress the chest, um, stop massive hemorrhage, and, and keep moving. Mm-hmm. Don't get stuck. And so if you train that don't get stuck reflex on the entire team, chances are if the entire team encounters a casualty, even if five of the six members get stuck on something, the sixth one will be like, hey, what about this? Um, and, and that's what you want. You want everybody in the team to be empowered to say, what about this? We missed this. We need to do this. Mm-hmm. This isn't working. You know, realizing that the medic is going to have the most experience, and certainly have the most procedural skill. You want to hold that procedural skill out to the very last, and only use it if it's needed. Because once the medic dives in to do something, um, then then his his thought immediately focuses on that task and miss seeing the field. So the more you can train the team to do more stuff. IV placements, um, hanging fluids, you know, life-saving interventions, head-to-toe surveys, monitoring in terms of vital signs and documentation, um, the, the better you reserve that medic mm-hmm. to be your quarterback and see the whole field. And, and you just have to train it. And the way, to, you know, the way to train it is with people who have been resuscitators or are resuscitators in their clinical practice. You know, very experienced medics probably... PAs, yes, docs for sure, um, mentoring them and kind of coaching them along the way. Hey, back out, look at this. Right. Um, and not just stand back with a clipboard and evaluate them, but um, but watch them and be an engaged coach. Right. You know? And being a, I mean, it's a definite skill is being able to at least mentally step back from the situation and start to think globally about you know, this is present, this is present, this is present, okay, this is what the problem actually is, mm-hmm. I'm going to start attacking the problem this way. Right. Um, you know, we'll, we'll do our life-saving interventions as a stopgap, but he needs to be moved in this direction mm-hmm. by, you know, whatever procedure. And the only way to even see that is being able to step back sometimes and, uh, you know, and think a little bit... Um, not necessarily disengaged, but kind of isolated from uh, you know, what is actually going on. Yeah, and have a, you know, as you're training, you know, have a mental checklist that you run through. You know, mm-hmm. March E is a great checklist. That's the one I would probably emphasize for medics. You know, for me as an intensive care doc, we treat organ system failure. And so the, the mantra that we get into is just running through the organ systems from neurologic at the top to um, endocrine at the most global, mm-hmm. you know, um, moving first through organs and then into, you know, um, widespread organs like the blood and the endocrine system. And I just run through those checklists as we're doing something and we're like, hey, you know, is there something to address here? Has it been addressed? Is there something that is going to need to be addressed? How are we going to monitor it? You know, what do I want to know? You know, and right. say for blood pressure, you know, we've given him a bolus. You know, let's recheck it in 30 minutes. Um, if it's stable, great. If not, let's give him another bolus. If he doesn't respond to the second bolus, let's start epinephrine, let's say in a septic patient. Right. Or if it's a ble- bleeding patient, you know, let's give him blood, and you know, if it looks like we're giving him a second unit of blood, and he could be headed toward a massive transfusion, let's make sure you know we're calling for platelets and, and um, uh, plasma mm-hmm. from the blood bank early to have it. You know, better to have it and not need it. Right. Right. So, um, but again, it's 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 training, and then um, what you and I were talking about before the podcast started, you know, mentored repetitions or coached repetitions. And that's one of the reasons why, you know, when we train our medics to try to have people who are experienced resuscitators, who've let, who've been the team leader in trauma resuscitations or ER resuscitations, um, mentoring the team. And I tell the cadre, Hey, this is, this is on the job training. This is not evaluation. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not standing there to see which of the items on your, instructor checklist they're doing and not doing and giving them a go or no go they there are other opportunities to do that this is pre-mission training we're trying to you know 
build up their education, build up their confidence, build up their cohesiveness as a team. Mm -hmm. So if you see something, you know, coach them through it and, and, and teach them along the way and, and they'll, they'll pick up on that and internalize it and do better at it the next time. Right. Absolutely. I mean, like anything else, it comes down to training. It comes down to practice. It comes down to just repetitions, even just finding out how of a nut roll this can really turn out to be if it's not done correctly. Right. Um, and for the medic, that's going to be one of the hardest things. You know, I honestly, in some of my medical training that I've done, I've seen team sergeants do the overall observation and leadership role better than the medics because the expectation on medics for so long has been, hey, doc, here's a sick patient, go do everything. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's a hard, it seems to be in some cases a harder reflex you know, for the medic to break out and be the medical leader and direct the team. Um, and so, you know, train, you know, train out of your comfort zone, you know, mm -hmm. and I, I definitely learned that in my residency, in my medical residency, you know, when I first started doing, you know, notional resuscitations with simulated patients in a simulation lab with the whole team, you know, I would dive in and I'd want to do the airway or I'd want to place the central line. Um, and you, you, you just have to work at it uh, to back out and let other people who are technically competent who could do those things but may not have the expertise to see the whole field, let them do that and you take yourself out of it and mm -hmm. force yourself. And maybe talk with your team sergeant and say, hey, you know, um, my role for this medical training is I want to be the, um, the leader and the observer um, and the manager. Um, if you see me getting out of that role, you know, whack me on the back of the head and right. tell me, hey, doc, step back. You know, we got this. Right. Um, and I've seen that happen, and it's been very effective. Yeah, you know? yeah very good. Um, well, thank you, Doug. I think this is a, this is a great podcast, and uh, hopefully we can at least help people start thinking about how to train and uh, develop themselves in uh, the, the team resuscitation team environment of this thanks dennis All right. cool. that's it for today's podcast be sure to go to our website www.prolongfieldcare.org find us on facebook youtube instagram subscribe and stay on the bleeding edge of combat medicine this is dennis for the pfc podcast Our boy is waiting there for you